right, let's get started. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining. This is our latest installment of our Inner Systems Partner webinar. Uh, today's uh, episode will be from George James Software, and they will demo Deltanji source code control that is tailored for Inner Systems Iris. I am Dean Andrews, Head of Developer Relations at Inner Systems, and I'll give you just a very brief background on Inner Systems and our developer resources. Inner Systems is a 40-year-old company. We are based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Our data technology supports the industries of healthcare, financial services, supply chain, and other industries as well. Just to give you a sense, in the healthcare industry, we have customers in over 80 countries, over a billion patient records around the world are managed on inner systems technology, about two thirds of the patient records in the United States. And we are considered a leader in data interoperability technology from industry analysts. The core of our technology is data as a data platform with smart data services built on top of it. We have the pillars of data management, data interoperability, and advanced analytics in our platform. Customers come to us because of the speed, scalability, and stability of our technology. It is available on any major cloud service, as well as on-premises deployments for regulated environments and other needs. And you can develop on our platform using any modern development language. We have a host of resources for developers, whether you're new to our technology or you're a regular user, you can find them at our developer hub at developer.innersystems.com. We have over 12,000 uh, developer members in our community around the world. You'll find tutorials and how-to articles, code samples, and a very vibrant uh, Q&A where you can find more information about our technology. By way of introduction, uh, George James Software is based in the UK. They have been in business for 30 years. They provide consulting services and developer tools, and they are a great partner of InterSystems. With that, I will pass it off to the George James software team for today's webinar. Um, thank you for that, Dean. Um, let me just share my screen. Um, here we go. Um, so thank you, Dean, and thanks everyone for joining us um, today. We'll be demonstrating our Deltanji source control tool, which, is, as Dean mentioned, is tailored specifically for InterSystems Iris. So we're George James Software. I'm Laurel, the Marketing and Business Development Manager. And we also have George, our CEO, and John, our Senior Product Engineer, joining us too. In case you're not familiar with us, George James Software have over 30 years of experience and expertise in providing innovative software solutions. Our work focuses on how we can help our customers do a better job of supporting and maintaining their systems and applications. It's, a well known, it's well known that over the long term, supporting a system is, is a much greater cost than the initial development. So the greatest gains can be had from improving the processes and practices in this area. The work that we do um, includes a range of developer tools to help achieve this. These range from ones that can be relied upon daily, becoming a staple in your development environment, to those that prove instrumental during one-off projects. So one of these tools is Deltanji, which we're here to talk to you about today. Uh, it was first released in 1991, and since then has been widely adopted by consultants, large organizations, and basically everyone in between who works with InterSystems environments. The great and unique thing about Deltanji is that it's highly configurable. So it can work to fit your organization rather than you changing the way that you work to fit with Deltanji. 
it has a number of features, um, including multi-version repository. Has a number of uh, has a number of features, including a multi-version code repository, support for branching and merging, and a comprehensive audit history. As you can, as you may have seen, we have been we have recently released a production component driver, which enables highly granular management of interoperability productions with tight integration into the management portal, which we'll be showing you in the demo as well. So now I'm going to hand you over to George, um, who is going to go into a little bit more detail about Deltangi itself. Okay, thank you, Laurel. Laurel, um, I'd like to start off by explaining how Deltangi source control is fully integrated with InterSystems RS. Um, this diagram shows all the touch points between Deltangi and RS. Um, you'll see across the top um, of the diagram are Deltangia's client integrations with all of the tools that are typically used to work with RS. Um, and across the bottom of the diagram are some of the kinds of things that need to be managed within RS. They, these are managed using um, uh, Deltangia's library of component drivers. Um, each component driver uh, knows about the characteristics of the thing that it's designed to manage, and it knows how to manipulate it natively. And this is how we achieve really tight and smooth integration into RS. So in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see that um, one of the things that we can manage is files. Um, now, if you're using something like Git or some other conventional source control tool, uh, then everything that's managed has to look like a file. If it isn't a file, you can't manage it. And that means that for a lot of the other things in an RS environment that you want to manage, you have to effectively roll your own or uh, cobble together uh, uh, a variety of different solutions that will um, form a complete solution for you. Um, however, with Dotanji, we do all that for you and everything comes ready to use out of the box. So um, you save a lot of time and get much better integration if you uh, take the Deltangi route here. Um, so Deltangi knows, for example, about the characteristics of classes. It knows how to manipulate and compile them. And it knows how to put them into namespaces, which is where you need to get them in order to be able to run them and test them and so on. Um, likewise, with object script, whether it's a routine that's a Mac or an int or an ink or whatever, for, whatever form it takes, uh, Delta NG knows what to do with it. Um, then there are the more exotic components um, that you have to deal with, um, such as lookup tables and HL7 schemas and production configuration items. Uh, as Laurel mentioned earlier, um, we have uh, the unit capability in Delta NG of managing the settings for each individual configuration item within a production. Um, as you might know, uh, configuration item settings are implemented in RS as a single monolithic class definition. Um, that makes it quite awkward if you've got a very large production, for example, um, uh, because you can't change individual parts of your production. Um, and often the requirement is to just change parts of your production. So with Delta Angie's production component driver, uh, we're able to reach inside the class definition and manipulate each configuration item separately. So in this case, we're treating the class really as just a container for the configuration items. Um, what this means is that you can check out, modify, check in, and promote just a single configuration item on a running production uh, without disturbing or conflicting with anything else that happens to be going on at the same time. And you'll see what this means in action during John's demo. So I'm not going to say much more about it here. Um, so Deltangi actually has a library of over 50 different component drivers. Uh, and these can manage all the things that you're likely to want to manage in an RS environment. Um, I've 
describe just a few of these here, but whether it's a set of nodes in a global or a row in a table um, or something else, then the most likely uh, it's most likely that we have a component driver for it in Deltangi. Um, and in a rare situation where you've got something exotic that you developed yourselves um, that, need, that you need to manage um, uh, with configuration management, then it's possible to build your own component driver and plug it into Deltangi um, and uh, uh, pr provide a solution even for things like that. Uh, and we provide a documented API for doing that. So um, uh, that, that's an option if you've got something very exotic in your environment. So uh, across the top of the diagram, uh, as I said before, um, these are the client integrations that we have into Aris. Um, and our goal and what we've achieved is a client integration into all of the places within Aris where you may find yourself editing or working on source components. Um, our integration provides the functionality for developers to carry out source control operations directly within the tool that they're working in. They're able to check out, check in, and promote items with minimum fuss and without needing to switch context. So let's look at each of these client integrations a little more closely. So starting off in the top left, we have the Dell Tangi portal itself. Uh, from here, you can perform all the standard source control operations, both manipulating individual items and or, or manipulating groups of items. Um, and you can mix and match uh, different kinds of items. So uh, if you've got, say, um, a, a set of changes comprising of a few classes, maybe some HL7 schemas, and perhaps a few global nodes or um, some production configuration items, uh, they can all be grouped together and managed as a single unit. Um, and you can do something like, for example, promote uh, a, a set of changes into production just using a, a single drag and drop operation. It, it's a very smooth way of managing things, very intuitive. Um, next, in terms of client integrations, we have VS Code. Uh, and this, I'm told, is where all the, the young hardcore developers are hanging out these days. Um, so we've got a very comprehensive integration into VS Code. And VS Code ha happens to be one of those tools that we really love. And um, uh, John, in particular, has been doing a lot of work with VS, VS Code extensions, um, not just in the Deltangi area, but in, in all sorts of other interesting areas. Um, so with our Delta Energy integration, de developers can see what's going on with their, with their projects in the, in the source control product panel. Um, and they can perform checkout, check-in, and promotion, code promotion, uh, just by right-clicking on the file that they're working in. Um, again, John's going to show a little bit of this and show some of the things that's possible during his demo. Um, for those that love Studio, and I think there's probably still quite a few people that do, um, Deltangi has always had full source control integration for, for Studio. Um, and we, we've always supported it and we'll continue to support it for as long as there are developers that still love to use it. So we're not forgetting Studio. Um, the next um, client integration is with the RS portal, the management portal. Um, there are quite a lot of things that are ed edited um, within dedicated screens in the management portal, for example, business rules. Um, Deltangi has got a client integration for each of these um, items, and it ensures that source control procedures are followed um, uh, correctly whenever someone is working on something in the portal. It's all too easy if you don't have that in place to to start changing things and then realize, oh, that should be something I'm doing under source control. So it's important to have that integration, otherwise things get changed without um, due process. Uh, the final um, uh, client integration that we have um, is a new integration um, for the production configuration page. Um, operating hand in hand with the 
production component driver that I mentioned earlier. It, it, this integration shows visually by color coding um, the source control status of each of the items in your production. Um, here, if something is color green, this indicates that it's checked out and can be edited. Uh, conversely, if something's color red, then it indicates that it's a new item that hasn't yet been registered with source control. Um, we, we also provide in this integration a source control button, um, which enables you to select items on the screen, uh, click the button, and that takes you to our standard uh, check-in, check-out um, dialogue. And from there, you can perform all the source control operations uh, that, you, um, uh, that you need to do. So we, we've seen how Delta NG has a library of component drivers that can manage natively all of the things within an RS environment. Um, I've also shown that we have client integrations for each of the tools that developers use when working with RS. Um, and it's this kind of reach that makes Delta NG the source control, the source control tool of choice for many users of Intersystems RS. Um, so before I hand over to John for the demo, I'd like to briefly mention Deltange's workflow capabilities. Um, these go beyond the traditional CI CD pipeline um, and provide a full workflow capability. Um, setting the scene for John's demo, this diagram shows a high level view of a fairly typical enterprise workflow. So over on the left, we've got a development environment comprising perhaps of several developer sandboxes. Um, we then have a, a flow that promotes changes to, to one or more test environments. And then it flows on to a staging environment, which kind of acts as a dress rehearsal for changes before they ultimately get promoted into production. Um, these workflows are generally fully configurable and include features like access control, conditional and, and alternate flows uh, and automation. So whatever the shape and size of your organization, you can build a workflow that, that will suit it. Um, so John is going to show us some of the, so John is going to show us some code uh, moving along this workflow and show how each of the different actors involved in this process would do, use Delta NG to monitor and act, interact with it. Um, I think he's going to start off with an actor called Dan the developer who's working in one of the development sandboxes. So over to John now for the demo. Thank you, George. Only that's it. Okay, thank you very much. As George says, um, Dan, the developer, is the first actor within my story. Um, he focuses on the top end of the workflow. Um, he will check existing code out from latest, which is a view of the uh, latest code within the Delta NG repository. He'll check it out to his dev location which is a namespace, a place that he can start editing the code. He can also create new code items there um, and register them into, into Delta NG. When he's um, done the coding he needs to within that namespace using uh, a VS Code or Portal or whichever tool is appropriate, he will check the code in from dev and say, this code is now ready for test. So um, on my story here, Dan has already got underway with a, um, a task he's been given. Um, he was given the task of uh, adding um, a, a new uh, business operation, producing output from an, for an existing um, production. Um, and the work that he's doing is grouped under what we call a change request, in this case, E1791, with a a uh, high level description of add file feed destined for research department. Um, where he's got to so far with this project is that he has um, uh, checked out a couple of um, classes he needs to work on 
um, and he's created a new class that he needs and, and has registered that already. So at the moment, his change request consists of three objects. Each object in this case is managing a single component. Uh, one feature of Delta Angie that George didn't mention, but I'll just mention in passing, is that occasionally there is a good business need for binding components together uh, uh, so that they travel around the source control world in absolute lockstep. Um, Delta Angie does that with great ease. So if you have code entities that need to travel together, always need to be checked out, versioned together, and moved together, Delta Angie can do that very easily for you. Um, in our simplest example here, um, we have single component objects. This one is managing a class component. Uh, this one also is managing a class component. Um, and uh, as you can see in the Delta Angie portal, you can get a visual representation of what's there. You can also find out where it came from in terms of its predecessor. Uh, and go and explore its predecessor and find out where its predecessor is active within the Delta Angie world. So there's lots of, of um, information available to um, all, any Delta Angie user within this portal. Um, so uh, uh, Dan, the developer, uh, has already uh, created um, this research file out um, class and he needs to do some work on it. And it's a class. Um, so the natural place for him to do that work is in VS Code. Um, the purpose in Dan's project of research file out is that he has extended the base class uh, HL7 operation file operation because there's a business need to do something special whenever an alert is being sent by um, this particular pathway through the production. Um, so Dan's overridden the send alert method. He hasn't yet decided quite what needs to be done. So he's put a little to do marker in there. Um, uh, he knows that he needs to do the superclass um, processing for this method, but there's going to be some more code he, he'll put in at this point. He'll come back to that later on. Um, he's um, got the class available um, and then uh, in terms of how it integrates with his production um, he'll use the uh, production configuration page he's added a um, a business operation uh, that he named to research file um, and in its informational settings you can see that it was um, it uses the research file out class that he has created. Um, however, he hasn't yet introduced this configuration item to Dale Tanji. So as George said, we have a color coding system here to research file is in a state we call unregistered. Dale Tanji uh, can see it, but uh, hasn't yet been told that it, it needs to start managing it. Uh, it's going to be very straightforward to start managing it. Um, uh, Dan can simply click on uh, the source control button there. Uh, the option is to register it into source control, um, and um, he will uh, choose to do that uh, on the E1791 project. Um, so he's chosen that. He can click the OK button, and its, its status color has changed from red to green. It's now under source control. Uh, and in the checked out state. So he can, um, uh, Dan can start doing some more work on this, on this um, project. However, life is not always like that for developers. And um, Dan has now been told that there is an urgent issue that needs to be sorted out elsewhere within this production. Um, the production is a fairly simple one, um, deliberately for demo purposes. Um, and at the front end of it, um, there's a business service that reads um, um, HL7 files that are being written by external systems. The, uh, the, the users of the production, the, the administrators of the production on the live server are reporting that sometimes the feed systems are taking a long time writing those files and that the production 
uh, needs to have a longer timeout on waiting to tell whether the file writing has been completed on by the by the sending system. So as an interface engineer, Dan knows that what he needs to do is is make a change on the from reg file uh, uh, item, the business service here. What he needs to change is under additional settings uh, where there is a file access timeout um, setting property. Um, and he's been told we need to increase that from two seconds to 10 seconds. Yes, there are other ways of doing it with system defaults and such like, but the story here is it needs to be done in the source all the way through the through the production. At the moment, Dan can't change that field. He can see its value, but he can't edit it because it's not yet checked out. But that's easy enough for Dan to do. He can, uh, at this point, click on the button. Um, Del Tanji says, well, you probably want to check this out, don't you? And you want to check it out from latest. Uh, to check it out, you're going to need to justify your work, associate it with a change request, and Dan is going to create a new bug type change request here. Um, and uh, he will give it a fairly um, fairly simple description, longer timeout. But in other circumstances, he might be expected to write more details in here, possibly even over on a second tab, some additional details about the nature of the work he's doing. Uh, as set up here, Del Tanji is automatically assigning um, B numbers for bug type uh, change requests. But uh, many of our sites um, use external numbering systems and simply use those reference numbers within Del Tanji to mean a, make a consistent pattern of things. Anyway, he's created B20914. He's going to OK the checkout. And uh, from reg file has gone green. This means he can go and change the file access timeout to 10, apply the change. Um, his production updates, of course. Um, he could do some testing here if he feels so inclined, um, but it's a demo um, and it's a relatively low risk change. Um, he's going to check this piece of code in. He can do that again straight from the page where he made the change to the config item. So he's now checked uh, in the, the from reg file. Uh, it's no longer green. Uh, to research file is still green. Um, so uh, Dan's responded to that urgent requirement, made the change. He can get back onto his research file, his E enhancement project. Our focus in the story now shifts to the next person in the, in the sequence. We have a tester. Uh, the tester is called Tim. And Tim looks at this part of the workflow. He looks at what is ready for test. Um, chooses of the items that are ready for test, chooses the ones he wishes to test, transfers them into his test location, performs whatever testing is appropriate in order to make a pass or fail decision. Um, if he concludes that the piece of work that was sent by the developers is not up to spec, um, he's going to fail it back to dev. Um, if his tests prove successful, he will pass the code, pass the work, and say this is now um, ready to proceed towards production. So Tim is going to look at his view of the um, in the Del Tangi portal. He will look at the ready for test location. And there, sure enough, is B20914, which Dan created a few minutes ago and has um, uh, made a change and sent it in there. Tim, if he's interested, can find out what is involved in this particular bug fix in the way of um, what, uh, what code items, what objects got changed. Um, he can um, read at this point any notes that Dan might have put on there about, for example, how this change has to get deployed. Um, in this case, it's a really simple one, so none of that becomes necessary. Um, and then he can simply drag it and drop it into his test location. Confirm that he did want to do this, that he's transferring B20914 from ready for test over to test. 
it might look as though Dan could have, uh, that uh, Tim could have transferred it to other places as well, but Del Tandy's workflow rules uh, prevent that. The, the workflow configuration says, wh where can things go once they are ready for test? They can't simply go straight to ready for stage. They have to go into the test area and go through some additional steps in the workflow. So that's all configured by you as Del Tandy sy system admins. So um, at this point, Tim can go and look at his production page uh, and go and see, um, if he so desires, he can go and see from reg file um, under the additional settings, file access timeout is now a value of 10. He can also um, be confident that uh, Thing, other things haven't changed. There's no sign of the fourth business operation that Dan, the developer, is working on over in the dev area. That hasn't been sent forward because Dan isn't ready to send that for testing. Tim is only testing um, this change in the from reg file config item. Um, <clears throat> having done his testing, um, Tim will then uh, promote um, B20914 from its current state of in test, he can promote it up to ready for stage. Um, this is assuming, of course, that it did pass testing. If it if it failed testing, he can choose to say, I'll fail this back to the developers. But um, in the interests of demo time, um, uh, Dan is doing a good job today. He's making the right changes. Tim is uh, doing the testing and saying we can pass that. Um, off it goes now, uh, it's gone to ready for stage. Um, and at the moment, that's all the work that Tim needs to be doing. Um, I now move to our third person in the story, Roz. Roz is the release engineer in this project and her job is to see what is ready for staging, um, transfer it into the stage system, the stage environment, uh, as a kind of dress rehearsal to make sure that um, when uh, this particular change or set of changes is, is subsequently going to go into prod, that um, uh, there are no unexpected dependencies that would cause things to break because Ros is very much in control of keeping stage in lockstep with prod, except for the changes that are about to go to prod and it avoids issues where the test environment has got um, multiple items under test um, and only some of them get approved for stage and uh, but there's a hidden dependency in there. So Roz um, again will make use of um, the portal view, look at her ready for stage location. Uh, B2914 is here. Let's um, drop that into the uh, into the stage area. Um, on her production config page, um, uh, the additional settings, file access timeout is now bumped up to 10 there. Um, the, um, the production namespace, which Ros also keeps an eye on, um, is of course um, with um, the from reg file, is still using file access timeout of two. Um, but Ros has, uh, validated that what she put into the stage area um, is um, is successfully um, uh, deployed into the into the stage environment. She's happy to say this is now ready for prod. Um, in some situations, uh, a site may decide that things that are ready for prod will get automatically deployed. Um, at a, a quiet time within the business. Um, um, other sites prefer to do that final transfer into the live environment under operator control, but um, it's all very flexible and configurable like that. In our story here, Roz is also responsible for deploying it live. She probably needs to get some kind of high level sign off for it, um, but then she can take it out of ready for prod. Um, and drop it into the, um, the prod area. And um, sure enough, over on here, when I reload the page, 
um, the additional settings while access timeout uh, is bumped up to 10. Um, so the urgent fix um, that uh, Dan did pretty rapidly has progressed through the, um, the testing and the deployments, the um, releasing stage. Back in, um, in Dan's world, um, he's carrying on um, with his task of, of the uh, adding on this research file feed. Um, because he got interrupted, um, uh, Dan um, needs to kind of uh, re remind himself where he's got to with things. Um, and he put a certain amount of the infrastructure in place, but at the moment he hasn't yet wired up his new output business operation to the production. So there's no um, path that sends something from this, um, this routing rule here in the middle over onto his item. So he's going to need to do that. And while he could use the, um, the rule editor, Dan quite likes doing things in code, particularly when it's a case of duplicating existing behaviors. So he's going over to, um, to VS Code here and loading up the routing rule class, which is um, the one that's implementing that um, um, uh, business process in the middle. It currently uh, has three send clauses. Um, and of course, uh, what, what Dan needs is a fourth one here, which in VS Code terms is quite easy to do, a copy and a paste. Um, and billing there, he, uh, he wants to be research. Um, uh, and then he can save that, and that's made the change. Uh, while I'm on this screen, before we go and look at it in the production page, uh, you might notice that as I made those changes, um, a little indicator appeared in the margin here. Um, this is Del Tangi leveraging a feature of um, VS Code and providing uh, quick diff markers to indicate how this file differs from what the source control says the previous version was. So clicking on that, we can get the confirmation that um, this was the one line that got inserted at that point. Um, there's a color scheme, green are insertions, blue are changes, and red are deletions. Anyway, um, uh, we'll uh, go over to um, verify that the production uh, indeed has uh, got the wiring in the right place. And sure enough, there's the extra line that we, we are now feeding stuff that comes through from reg file, um, goes to here. Uh, this one goes to here, this one then goes out to four output operations. Um, back over in VS Code, uh, the other bit of change that, um, that Dan needs to do before he's ready to send this up for testing with Tim is actually implement that little piece of to-do code. Um, so um, he, he's now worked out what it is he needs to do um, in the case of a, an alert being sent by stuff that's going to the research file. Um, uh, he wants to augment the, uh, the message that the uh, superclass is going to do the standard alert processing with. Um, and he's going to do that by, uh, in this case, concatenating onto the end of the, the message, just a little uh, qualifier text. Obviously this is demo level coding, uh, real world, you'd be doing something a little bit more serious. Um, again, change markers are coming up in the border here. These ones are indicating lines that were changed rather than uh, com added completely new. So the to do message got changed to an augment the message comment, um, and then an additional line got put in at the bottom there. Um, so I can save that change. Uh, we're editing server side, so the save goes straight in onto the namespace. Um, Dan can uh, run some test data through it, verify that everything's behaving properly. Um, he doesn't, though, need to leave this page. Uh, he doesn't need to leave VS Code if he's decided, I'm now ready to send this up for testing. Uh, in the source control view um, in, in VS Code, Del Tangi has this representation of the E1791 change request. The four uh, 
member objects that constitute the change, um, one being the production configuration item, uh, and then three being the other classes that needed to be either created or changed. And in a single click on the check-in operation here, uh, he can, Dan can check in the whole change request. All four um, uh, items, if I highlight the word checked in, you'll see three other ones get highlighted down below. There are four check-ins happen just as a result of might be doing the one click there. Um, and that then means that um, if Tim is keeping an eye on his uh, ready for test inbox, um, he now gets to see that E1791 is ready for him to start testing. And sure enough, it's got the four items that, that Dan needed to create or change in order to, to do the processing. So um, we'll stop uh, the, the general story at that point. I will finish up by giving you my overview diagram, um, a recap of what we did. Um, Dan, the developer, worked at this level, checking things out, checking things in. Uh, Tim, the tester, worked at this level saying, what's ready for test? Um, I will update my test environment when I'm ready to test that. Um, I will either fail those items or I will pass them. And then if I'm passing them, I'm effectively handing them over um, for ROS in order to do the, um, the staging for uh, ultimate deployment to production. In this particular workflow, we've decided that as soon as code has passed testing, it is eligible to be built upon for the next iteration of development. Some sites uh, feel that's too soon. Some sites don't want to let the next iteration go uh, uh, around until the code has been deployed out to production. But that's entirely configurable within Dell Tangi. You decide at what point you want the workflow to loop back around. You decide where you want to have um, undo loops, effectively routing back up the workflow to say that's failed, send it back up the tree. And even sophisticated things like saying, when you failed some code, do we want to keep the, the actual content of the failed code for auditing and educational purposes? Or do we just simply give the developer the same thing back and say, you know, fix your, fix your bugs and we'll pretend we never saw the previous version from you? That's what I wanted to show. Uh, I'll stop the showing now and hand back to Laurel. Thank you, John. Um, so we're just opening the floor up for any questions. Um, please send them our way and we'll, well, George and John will answer them. <laughs> and I think there are some people watching on YouTube as well. So if you have any questions, then just type them in and they'll make their way over to us as well. Okay, I think everybody's on mute. So if you've got a question, you'll probably need to unmute yourself first. I guess I have a question for, for those watching. Is source control something that you are already doing, um, but um, are not too happy with how it's going? Or uh, is source control something that you feel you ought to be doing? I haven't quite got around to yet, um, because we we see both kinds of of scenarios uh, arise and Dell Tangi deploys very effectively in on brand new sites, but it also deploys well in on sites that have all have, have a, a history of development and perhaps already three or four tiers worth of, of, of code in varying stages. And, uh, and Dell Tangi can help you sort out what you've got, um, bring it under a, um, a good degree of control, and then you can progress forward with a, with a with a procedure, with you know, with with standard operating procedures, rather than um, uh, the 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 rather ad hoc stuff that can happen. Um, so we've got a question that's just popped in the chat. Um, on the last workflow diagram, what happens if the change fails in stage? Does the change go back to dev or to test? So so in our diagram, because we're we're trying not to um, overwhelm uh, newcomers to Dell Tangi with too many paths within the workflow. We haven't put in a, 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 a what if um, staging fails kind of sequence. Um, 
in effect, probably what happens uh, in uh, certainly with some some organizations would be that because at the point of passing from test, the code is available for the developer to start iterating the next version on, the staged version would probably be um, failed over to the side and saying, we're just never going to deploy this version because there's a problem with it. Um, and then wait for and notify the people upstream in development, make the change and then send a, a better version downstream via testing to stage. Um, in practice, the um, the kind of things that, that that would get checked at the stage level are more likely to be, have we got the dependencies um, all lined up right? Uh, have we inadvertently uh, had something pass in the testing area because it's taking advantage of some other feature that is under test? Um, and then when it's decided what can what can get deployed via stage to prod. Uh, we haven't realized that project X can't go until project Y has gone or they have to go at the same time. So staging, in our experience, staging is more often about detecting those kinds of um, uh, omissions of, of, of foresight rather than saying it flat doesn't work here. Um, Many, many organizations have more than one test environment. They might have a, um, a test environment that, that, that works with um, small quantities of data, and then they might have another test environment that works with some, some real heavy load testing and perhaps doing some performance testing. Um, but, but all of those, those scenarios, the Delta Angie workflow can handle. Another question, um, can a developer using already a Git workflow convert slash import his Git history into Delta Angie? I guess, um, I mean, George might have a view on this too. I guess my, my, my initial response is in principle, yes, it's possible. We do occasionally have sites that have um, uh, implemented Delta Angie to replace an existing source uh, control system. And they sometimes at least talk with us about, um, uh, shall I bring the, bring the history in? Um, uh, I think generally speaking, what people do with history is it depends how, what the purpose of it is. If it's to satisfy the auditors, um, it may just be more effective to keep the old system on ice somewhere. And if the auditors come by and say, who deployed this code into production uh, 18 months ago, you can fire up the old system and get the answer out of that. Um, but in principle, um, the, the process of ingesting into Delta Angie a, an existing code base can include ingesting a history of existing code, the existing code base. So effectively, um, load up what the code looked like la last year, load that in as your version zero Delta Angie objects, then roll the history forward, uh, load in the differences to load in your version ones and, and, and so forth. Is there anything else if anyone wants to ask? I, I'd be interested, I, I recognize a couple of names on the, on the uh, session here as people who I think are, are currently using Delta Angie and perhaps have used it for quite a long time. And um, obviously um, we, we've been showing some of our new stuff in relation to interop productions, but, but a lot of what's in here is, is, is core Delta Angie uh, capability and possibly some of the existing users um, may have uh, comments or observations about about what it uh, does for their organization. John, this is Paul Clements here from uh, Axel, former Infor. Yeah, um, yeah, it, it sounds, yeah, it looked very familiar what you've shown me, uh, because this is exactly the way that we are managing our source control uh, within the organization. Yeah. And, yeah, don't know what it, it, it works for us. Uh, we are uh, also using a development uh, testing staging area and then making uh, tying a build process to the staging area and taking that to upload, upgrade the customers that we have. So we, we don't have a, 
uh, because we have many on-premise uh, uh, deployments, we, we don't have a direct uh, push to the to the production systems of the customers, but mm. we do uh, do a build process and we deliver an upgrade set that we update there. But for managing the source, uh, we are exactly using the route that you described there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ha Hello, Paul. Um, it's nice to see you on the session. Hey, John. Uh, uh, yeah. George. <laughs> So, so how long have you been using Delta NG4 now, Paul? Do you, do you have any idea? Uh, that may be close to 20 years now, I think. Is it really? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I started with uh, the library division in 2002, and very shortly thereafter, we uh, started implementing it, yeah. Okay, we have another comment in the... Um in the message window from Tony Guinness, who says, uh, yes, long time user of Del Tangi from the 1990s onwards. I'm very happy with it. Currently interested in the VS Code integration. Um, so thanks, Tony. That's another one of our customers that's uh, listening in. So for, for people that are not existing customers, um, uh, not existing users of Del Tangi. Um, uh, do we have any any more questions or any thoughts about um, uh, what you need to know about taking the next step to getting on board with Del Tangi? Um, may I have a tricky question? Sure, go on, if Danny. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, uh, my question is: Do you use uh, Del Tangi internally for development? And uh, and in, in particular, uh, do you use Diltanji to develop Diltanji? Uh, yes, we do. Um, <laughs> from day one, Diltanji has been uh, doing the source control for Diltanji. <laughs> we we definitely do that. Yes. And, um, and in our context, we are shipping the product to um, to customer sites and keeping up using Del Tangi to track exactly which version of the code we sent to which customer sites. So when we are uh, looking at an issue for a particular site, we can tell um, by looking at our records uh, uh, exactly what code uh, we shipped to them. And so if they are, whether or not they have a particular fix, and if not, we can uh, send the fix to them, update our records, and and keep a track that they've had that. So, so we use it very effectively for that. So we have a, a message in the message window from Jane that says also using Del Tanjo with Studio. So this is a, a one of those uh, lovers of Studio that I mentioned. Um, but it sounds like she's thinking of going to VS Code. So she was quite interested to see the demo. Uh, one, one thing, actually, Jane, is that at your site, I believe some people are using VS Code and some people are using Studio. So it is perfectly reasonable and, and uh, quite normal for a mix and match of, uh, approach to occur where some developers use one tool and other developers uh, use another tool. Essentially, you've got the option to use the tool of your choice, whatever works best for you. Okay, well, um, if there's nothing else, last final shout, final shout. Um, so I will, oh, oh, here we go. <laughs> um, so we, so Robert has asked, we used our Tanji um, with Cachet for about five years. It has helped us greatly. We shall be moving to Iris for health shortly with our Tanji. Are there any things to watch out for? And then Martin has asked, um, are there, are, is there the possibility to compare different forks? Um, yeah, I can, I can uh, give a quick answer to, um, to both of those. So with Robert, um, the, the, the key factor is as long as you're um, up to date with your, with your Del Tangi version, uh, so as long as you're on version 7.0, um, 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 migration over to Iris for Health should be very straightforward. Um, and um, it's worth worth you being in touch with us through the support channels just to, to check on that. And um, we're willing to help you with that as part of support to, to keep you uh, comfortable with Delta as you move over. 
Some sites actually use Deltanji to help the migration process. So they have a Deltanji which covers their old environment and their new environment to allow parallel testing. Others, others will simply say, well, we'll do the upgrade and use the source control going forward. Um, so for Martin's question, uh, yes, there's a possibility for doing the compares. We integrate um, with a third party diff, diff tool called Beyond Compare um, and use Beyond Compare to, to be able to say, I'd like to compare the contents of this location uh, with that location. And sometimes locations are not physical namespaces. They are, if you like, labels within the repository of, of particular releases. Uh, so Beyond Compare lets you do a code level diff. Um, Beyond Compare also has a neat way with Del Tangi of being able to say, what are all the changes that this change request made to all of its component objects um, in order to, uh, to implement this, this change? So yeah, the Beyond Compare integration is, is pretty effective with that. And that we bundle Beyond Compare licenses with Del Tangi licenses. So it's no, no additional cost. Thank you. Um, Laurel, perhaps you could just say a word about um, uh, what the next steps would be if somebody is interested in um, uh, uh, taking a deeper look at Delta Energy. Um, yeah, so I'll pop up our contact details on the screen now. So if, um, yeah, if you did want to get in touch, um, our email addresses are there. So um, we'd be happy to have a chat one on one about how we can help you. Um, you can have a take a look at our website, georgejames.com, where there's further information about Del Tangi. Um, we offer a number of different licenses and the details of the licenses are on our website. Um, and there's a free um, solo edition that you can try out um, if you if you want to give that a go. Um, and yeah, so we'd also love you to follow us on social media as well. So if you just search for George James Software, um, yeah, you can stay up to date with what we're doing. Okay, thank you, Laurel. And thank you, everybody, for um, uh, coming and joining us today and uh, listening to us. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks, George James team. Thank you. Bye. Bye. It's a good one.